please. And I'd like to introduce, for those of you who weren't here yesterday, Dr. Steve Lennox, um, pastor and also now president of Kingsword University. And uh, we had a wonderful, wonderful morning yesterday with him about how to study our Bible. And so I can't wait to hear what he has to bring us this morning. I doubt we do that. And that's kind of the way it is when we open our Bibles. <clears throat> we take for granted the fact that we've got the Bible in our language, in a, in the, in not only just in the English language, but in an English language that we understand and can read, make sense of. But how many times do we stop and ask ourselves, how did I get this? I mean, we know that this Bible didn't come to us like this. That this is the end of a process which probably took 2,500 years, give or take. And it didn't start in English for sure. I mean, you know that. It actually started in some languages that nobody speaks anymore. It started in, in Hebrew, and then some in a language called Aramaic, and then the New Testament was written in Greek. And while people speak Hebrew and Greek, it's not the same as the Hebrew and Greek they spoke when it was originally written down. So there's a long process that gets us from when the first uh, pen wrote on a piece of animal skin or a piece of broken pottery or a piece of papyrus to where we have it now. And that's what I want to do this morning is just walk us back through that process just so we have a better awareness of how it is that we got our English Bibles. <clears throat> and I think what you'll find, at least what I found in studying this, is two things. One is, this is not the process I would have expected. In order to transmit to us infallible, which means it doesn't make a mistake, authoritative, which means it has the authority to tell me what to do with my life, inerrant, which means it doesn't misfire when it comes to identifying things. This word was given to us in a process that I wouldn't have expected. That's one thing you'll notice. That God chose to use a process which involves human beings. It's a very human process. And the second thing I think, I hope that you notice at the end, and I'm going to emphasize it, is that God found a way using this very interesting process to get us a Bible that we can rely on, to get us a Bible that we can have confidence in, to get us a Bible that is without error and is infallible, and even more than any of that, a Bible that has the capacity to produce change in our lives in the hands of the Holy Spirit. So you're going to see it's a very human process, but you're also going to see that God, in the end, accomplished his purpose, and we can trust his word. Now, at any point along the way, uh, questions are fair game, so feel free to interrupt me. I've got some things I want to show you, but uh, I'd much rather answer your questions than uh, answer the ones that I think you're asking. So uh, feel free to interrupt. Those of you who were here yesterday, I hope you felt the same way, but, um, but that's my invitation to you. Uh, before I get going actually into that, I'll just do a little commercial here. You'll notice out on the back there are, there's literature there on Kingswood. And uh, that's the, the Bible college that you help to support through uh, your giving. Uh, we're located in New Brunswick, Sussex, New Brunswick. We've been there for a uh, good 50-some years. We were 75 years old or, or so. Actually spent a little time in Yarmouth uh, between uh, the 40s and 50s. We are, we are a school that is exclusively devoted to preparing men and women for ministry, whether that's vocational ministry like Pastor John or your pastor that's coming in, or the kind of ministry that every one of us has the capacity to do, being a grandparent, being a lobster fisherman, being a carpenter, working in retail, whatever. 
God has called us to a ministry, and Kingswood is a great place to prepare for ministry of any kind. So if you know of somebody like that, I'd invite you to stop at the table and uh, take some literature for them. Or if you yourself are thinking, you know what, I'm not going to go back to school, but I'd love to learn more of this kind of stuff. We just announced what we're calling Kingswood Extended, which is a way for us to provide education to people who don't have to come to Sussex, New Brunswick. And so if you're interested in something like that, stop by and give me your name and we'll get back to you on that. I also have some brochures of our trip to the Magdalen Islands, which we're taking next September. If that's on your bucket list, I can help you fill your bucket with lobster and other stuff. So, Not that you're any strangers to lobster, but I, I, they tell me it's beautiful. Who was I talking to that was, was there? Yeah. Pretty place, eh? Yeah. Okay. So join us. That's uh, September 16th. All right. The Bible starts in, as I said, about 1,500 years before Christ. We don't know what the first book of the Bible was that was written. That sounds strange, doesn't it? You'd assume it was Genesis, and it probably was, but some people assume that it was another book. Anybody know what the other leading candidate for the first book of the Bible to be written down? Uh, actually, no, though Enoch appears early on in the book of, uh, in the book of Genesis. There is another book. Yes. Some people think that Job was written first because the content of the book of Job has some stuff that's really old. But I think it's probably Genesis. And it was written in Hebrew. I'll show you a picture of what Hebrew looks like. a little hard to read. <laughs> Anybody know what that's written on? Actually, it's written on a piece of pottery. Yeah. It's called an ostracon, a broken piece of pottery. Instead of discarding it, they would put it to secondary use and actually write notes on it, write messages on it. Probably didn't write the scripture on it, but they could have written any number of things. And archaeologists are still discovering pieces of pottery with writing on them. I was doing a dig in um, just off the Mediterranean coast at a town called Dur, and we were uncovering broken pieces of pottery all over the place, but you had to be very careful when you brought them up because, of course, they have dirt and things on them, and you want to brush it off. But if you brush it off, you may be brushing off writing on it, so you have to be really careful. But that's, uh, that's an early form of Hebrew writing, and Hebrew is written from right to left. We read... We write from left to right. They write from right to left. And you'll notice those uh, scratches on there. It'll be a little clearer in this next slide. That's a little easier to read, right? You can get that, right? So the process of moving from the, the scratches, the handwritten scratches, to something more like this is very helpful. You'll notice one difference is they've separated the words. Just go back to that preceding slide. You notice there's no spaces between the words? So you, just have to, you would just have to know where the word end, one word ends and the other word begins. But when it comes to the manuscripts that we use to translate our English Bibles, they've separated the words. You'll also notice, you probably didn't notice this because the, the previous slide was not as clear, but there are little dots and dashes above and below the lines. Can you see that?
right there, and there, and there's a little dot um, above the line, and there. Those are the vowels. So originally, it was just consonants. Now, they had vowels. They just didn't write them. You, were just, you, you would just know what the vowels were. You'd see that particular set of consonants, and you'd know you have to supply these vowels to make that word. Well, at some point, they decided they better add the vowels in because people didn't know what those consonants meant and how to pronounce them. And so they added the vowels in, but the, the text, and this is an important theme, especially when we're dealing with the Old Testament manuscript. The text was so special to them that they felt it would do an injustice to the text if they actually pulled the consonants apart and put the vowels in between. So they developed a system of what they call pointing so that the vowels are above and below the line and they can keep the consonants together. That word right there is the verb, yep, there we go, the verb to be. That word right there is the word Yahweh or Jehovah. Anybody remember in uh, Exodus 3 where God introduces himself to Moses? He's, he says, my name is, anybody remember? I am. I am who I am from the verb to be. I didn't plan on giving you this Hebrew lesson here. But, but I know you don't know these letters, but can you see the similarity between that word and that word? Can you see it? They look alike. It's because the word Yahweh comes from the verb to be. So it starts in Hebrew, written down earliest, probably 1500, 1400 BC, before Christ. The latest book written probably 400 years before Christ. And that book was probably First and Second Chronicles. So that's not the last book in our Bible. The last book in our Bible in the Old Testament is Malachi. But the last book in the Hebrew Bible. In other words, if you have a Jewish friend and you ask them to, sh uh, to show you their Bible, they will have Genesis, and the last book in their Bible will be Second Chronicles. But everything that's in the Jewish Bible is in our Old Testament, just arranged a little differently. So between 1500 B.C. and 400 B.C., that's the time period in which the Old Testament was originally written down. Now, theirs was a traditional culture, which means that their culture relied on memory a whole lot more than ours does. And so they would remember their history orally. So if you've ever traveled, if you've traveled in any kind of third world areas, uh, or if you spent much time in the First Nation community, you know that there are cultures which make a great use of memory and can remember genealogies, for example, can remember the names of families and grandparents and great-grandparents and great-great-grandparents. Do you know who your grandparents are? Sure. Do you know who your great-grandparents are? Some of you do. Anybody know their great-great-grandparents name, any kind of biographical information? See, now, we're a modern culture. Theirs is a traditional culture, which means in a modern culture, we value the future and youth, and in a traditional culture, they value the past and the aged. In some ways, some of them have said, that traditional cultures, like the one we meet in the Bible and the one you'll meet in these third world countries and some First Nation uh, uh, communities, they are backing into the future. And the most important thing about you and me is not what we do and what we're going to do. It's where we come from, who your parents are, who your grandparents are, what the village was that you grew up in. So it's a very different way of looking at the world all of that to say for our purposes this morning that they relied a lot on oral transmission of material. So if Moses wrote down the first material that we have in our Bibles, the book of Genesis, where did Moses get the stories of creation? Of the murder of Abel by Cain, of the story of Noah, the story of Tower of Babel. Moses wasn't alive at that time. Probably this material is communicated orally, 
and there are oral stories that he knows and, and ends up writing down. We know that Moses wrote down some things right away because it tells us that in the books of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Yes, sir? Yeah, that's a great question. And it actually is an indication of how different we are from the ancient world. For us, if, if you make me a deal, you're going to sell me something. I want it in writing. Now, you and I don't know each other. Obviously, I'll get it in writing. But even if we knew each other, we'd probably put it in writing, wouldn't we? Because we consider writing more authoritative, more likely to be true than we do the spoken word. But you know that in the ancient world, it was exactly the opposite. They wouldn't say put it in writing. They would actually consider your spoken word, the communication of that oral story, more likely to be true because of they know who said it. So if it's written down, it's just kind of free-floating. It's just like, who wrote that down? How do I know that that's true? There's no person whose reputation lies behind this. But, but in the ancient world, the reputation was the speaker. So that, in other words, when we would say, well, who knows, it's telephone, you know, it can go off in any different directions. That's because we don't value the transmission, the accurate transmission of material the way that ancient culture would have. Yeah. But you get my point. Yeah, in our culture, we are much more dependent on writing it down. But in those cultures, they would be much more dependent on the actual oral transmission and the, the authority re rested in the spokesperson. So there was a lot more responsibility on the spokesperson to get it right. <clears throat> and I don't know if you've actually listened to uh, someone from one of these traditional communities tell the story, but their capacity to recite by memory with an incredible degree of accuracy is remarkable. So it isn't like telephone. It's, it's accurate. So that, that would be one way of responding. But you've touched on the first point that I think is important for us to get here. This process that God employs of using oral tradition and the other ways that humans are going to be involved does not prevent the possibility of a mistake. I don't want to throw anybody off. But God chose to use a process whereby people could write down the wrong thing or they could recite the wrong thing. Now, before, you're, before we're done, I want to move us on to realize that even in spite of the process that God employed, he actually gave us a scripture that we can be 100% confident in. But he didn't do it in the way that, that I, I'll just say myself, he didn't do it in the way that I would have thought would have accomplished that goal. So I'm glad you asked that question because it keeps this on the table for us. <clears throat> the first five books of the Old Testament are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And we call those the law, sometimes the Torah, T-O-R-A-H, which means law. That's the most authoritative part of the Old Testament for the Jews. And everything else that was written after that was compared against what those first five books said. And that was kind of like the yardstick against, those, against which those other books were measured. Those first five books, probably very early on within Moses' lifetime, everybody that was a Jew accepted that as their Bible. But then other books were written, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, Samuel, Proverbs, Psalms, Job, and so forth. And those books gradually came to be accepted as scripture. So the Old Testament, I'm going to use the term canon, C-A-N-O-N, -N, so not the kind of thing you shoot at people. It's just a word that means yardstick, rule, measuring stick. The Old Testament canon, the 39 books of the Old Testament, first the five books almost immediately, and then the subsequent books, the rest of the, the 34, gradually came to be accepted as authoritative. And by the time you get to the end of the Old Testament period, just before the time of Christ, all the Jews would have agreed on which books were in their Bible. Everybody with me? So it starts maybe 1500 BC, 
the last book written is about 400 B.C., and in the remaining 400 years, that whole Old Testament comes to be treated as, as, as the Bible. Now, it wasn't the Old Testament. For the Jew, it was their Bible. But then along comes the early church, the Christians, and what do they do with the Jewish Bible? They accept it. It becomes their Bible. And so for Jesus, for the apostles, for Peter, for Paul, for James, for Jude, their Bible was the Jewish Bible. Now, other things are being written down at the time. Go ahead to the next slide. Go ahead to the next one. Other things are being written down. What we know. now as the New Testament, but when they were being written, they probably weren't thinking, okay, this is, the, this is the start of the New Testament. They were writing things because, well, things had to be written. I'm talking about the early church now. They're writing down things that had to be written. The first writings by the early Christians were not the Gospels. They were the letters. So probably the first New Testament book to be written was not a book at all. It was a letter. Probably the letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica in northern Greece. Now, when Paul wrote a letter, when Peter wrote his letters, when James wrote his letter, when John wrote his letters, he isn't just publishing a newsletter, and he's not consciously writing a book. That's the way we think of them. He's writing a letter, and he's writing a letter to a real group of people, people who had issues, people who had problems, they had questions. And so... As we talked about yesterday, when you're reading those epistles, we call them, then you want to be thinking of, okay, why, why was this written? Why did Paul write this letter to the Thessalonians? So the first books were written, were not really books at all. They were just letters. And they were letters written to individuals just like you and me who had questions. And Paul or the other writers chose to answer those questions in written form. The next group of books that were written are the Gospels. Probably Mark is the first one that was written, and John the last one that was written. Mark probably wrote his gospel around the year 45 or 50 A.D., so a good 10, 20 years after the time of Jesus. The gospel of John, probably at the very end of the first century, maybe around 90 A.D. Now you say, why didn't the gospel writers write this stuff down sooner? You would think... As important as it is that we know the truth about Jesus, I mean, that's the center of everything we believe, you would have thought they would have, that Mark would have gone home and written it down right that day. But he didn't. And it's back to what we were talking about earlier, the importance of eyewitness accounts, the importance of the oral tradition. And the only reason that the Gospels come to be written down is because the eyewitnesses are dying off. And so somehow this has to be communicated to the next generation, and that's why the Gospels are written. Now, they're not written as letters. They're probably written as more like what we would think of as books, to preserve the teachings of uh, Jesus and his life. Now, what I'm showing you up here is a small fragment of the Gospel of John. And so let's stop here and just point out a few things. You probably noticed right away it wasn't written in Hebrew. It's written in Greek. It's written in a particular form of Greek known as Koine Greek, K-O-I-N-E, which means common Greek. Now, if you remember back to your high school classes, there, was a very, uh, there were very famous Greek authors like Homer, most of which his material was communicated orally, by the way, but eventually written down. But it was written down in a very high, kind of classical form of Greek. You and I might think of like Shakespeare's English, you know, kind of like that, or legal English, and then you'd think there's common English, kind of the way you speak it here on the island. 
And you use expressions here on the island that we don't use off the island. <laughs> I'll just tell you that. I wanted to go fishing with Marty Swim on, on uh, Friday because I had such a great time doing it last year. And uh, I can't remember exactly how he said it, but I couldn't go out because they want blowing. I said, okay. <laughs> they want, is that the right way of expressing it? They want what? It's going to blow. So I said, well, I don't want to be there when it blows. So, <laughs> Now, Greek, you read left to right. And you notice there, um, from what you can see there, there's not a whole lot. Anybody know what that's written on? Parchment is a good guess, but notice the weave. This is papyrus. Papyrus is a plant that grows in certain parts of the, of the Mediterranean world. It's a reed, a triangular-shaped reed. It's split open and then sliced very thin and woven into a form of paper. Most of the writing substances prior to the discovery of papyrus were animal skins, which is where you take the, either a sheep or a goat or a cow, and the belly part, which is the thinnest part of the animal skin, is stretched and treated and stretched and treated and eventually cut into paper uh, shapes and written on. And that has the advantage of you can write on it and erase it and use it again, and it lasts a little while. Parchment is uh, not as durable, but it's much less expensive. And there was actually uh, a library in a, in a city in, of, called Pergamum in Turkey, and now called Bergama, and they had the monopoly on vellum and parchment, the animal skin, and they didn't want anybody else writing anything down because they wanted to be the exclusive library, and that's when uh, papyrus was discovered and developed, and that was just the common writing material. Again, not real durable, as you can see here, but that's where that P in P52 comes from. It stands for papyrus, and they number each of these things. There are 5,000 fragments like this in Greek of the New Testament, 5,000. Some of them are real small like this. Some of them are much bigger, maybe even whole books, whole New Testaments, but 5,000 in Greek. That compares to Homer's Iliad when there's just over 600 manuscripts. So I want you to keep that in mind. When we're actually trying to figure out what the original author, the human author, actually wrote down, we've got 5,000 things to compare it to. And something like Homer or Euripides, the Greek tragedian, he only has 300-some. So there's a lot of these Greek manuscripts. And then there's manuscripts of translations into Latin and Syriac and uh, Coptic the Egyptian language. So this is where it starts in the New Testament. <clears throat> the last book of the New Testament that was written is, is probably the book of Revelation, probably about five years before the turn of the century, 95 AD, so about 60 years after Christ. Let me pause here and see what questions you have. So we've got the Old Testament written and accepted as, as scripture. The church owns that as its scripture and then begins to produce its own literature, not consciously thinking it's writing a Bible, but consciously thinking it's writing material that needs to be preserved. Questions? Now, how, does the, how do these books that, the, that, that, that were written by the early church, how did they come to be accepted as the Bible? This process is going to take about 200 years so quicker than it took the Old Testament, but still a while. Now, you and I would think, at least I would think, that the way these books were determined to be scripture is that they got a group of men, probably, into a room, and they laid all these books out on the table, because there was, there was the 27 books that we have, and then there was a bunch of other books that people were writing, not just the, not just the New Testament we know. There's lots of books being written. And they spread them all out on that table back there, and they just voted. Right? Isn't that what we would do? That's not what God did. Here's what he did.
Yep, yep. Oh, uh, There's no question in my mind that every one of those authors, Peter, Paul, John, all of them, wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. No question. No question what they wrote was absolutely what God wanted written down. I'm not sure that in every case the authors knew that what they were writing was going to end up being a book that was read thousands of years later. But they all knew this is what God wanted them to write. So absolutely, I agree 100% with what you're saying there. I agree with you there, too. Well, you must have read my notes while I was out there. Yeah, be yep, I, I agree. And, and exactly the points that you're making is how God chose to reveal to us which books should be in the Bible and which shouldn't. It wasn't a committee decision. It was that God turned loose these books into the church, and over the period of 200 years, those books were not chosen. They chose themselves. Just as our brother has described, when you get your hands on the truth, it becomes apparent to you that it's the truth. So it wasn't that somebody decided, yeah, this book in, that book out. It was that the books themselves demonstrated that they came from a source that was more than human, that they spoke a truth that no human being could know in and of himself. So the books that end up in our Bibles are books that prove themselves to be inspired. And what the church does is recognize what it had already decided in practice. Yeah, that's exactly, that's exactly what I'm talking about. That's the process. So here's the way it looks. Go on to the next slide. By about 200 A.D., so 170 years or so after the time of Christ, the church had recognized, this is a slow process, the church had recognized that all the books of the New Testament are inspired, with the exception of these books. They're, not to say that they weren't inspired, they're just not sure. Hebrews, James, 1 and 2 Peter, 3 John. But it also includes two books that you and I probably wouldn't know about, Wisdom of Solomon and Revelation of Peter. There was some sense that maybe they were. All right, go on to the next one. <clears throat> By about 315 A.D., They've decided that definitely they can see the hand of God in the four Gospels, the book of Acts, the letters of Paul, 1 Peter, 1 John, Revelation. They're still not sure about James. They're still not sure about Jude. They're still not sure about 2 Peter and 2 and 3 John. But they pretty much decided that those two books that we talked about in the last slide, they didn't make the cut. And these other books didn't make it either. And then go on to the next slide. The first time we see a church leader actually identifying which of the 27 books is in the year 367 A.D. And then a few years after that, next slide. In 
in 397, in the Council of Carthage, the church makes it official. My point here is, just as these guys said, it was not so much that the church selected the canon. They didn't go back in a back room and say, all right, these books are in, these books are out. It was this process, this, this process that involved human beings getting their hands on the Bible and over time saying, oh, this is, more, this is more than a human word. This is a word from God. I know God is speaking to me. And the collective wisdom of the church produces the canon that we have. Now, isn't that an interesting process? I actually like it better than the idea of those guys in the back room. Because who are those guys? Now, maybe they have the wisdom that our brother's talking about, but maybe they don't. And how do we know they really understood? I like the idea of God using the collective wisdom of the church to, to draw this out and then the church confirming it. Anyway, that's how it happened. Let's go on to the next slide. Now, the printing press isn't invented until a, about the 15th century. And the first book that's printed on a printing press is the Bible. But that means that every manuscript, every one of these letters, every one of the Gospels, everything from the Old Testament is all written by hand. And it's written on scrolls, and it's written on parchment, and it's written on whatever they could get their hands on. The guy that we call the writer is, we, we call him a scribe, and he's actually writing down from, he has, a, he has his manuscript here, and the blank manuscript here, and he looks here, and he sees what he's got, and then he starts to write, and he copies it by hand. Let's go on to the next slide. We have a scroll at Kingswood. A couple of weeks ago, I was invited to the city of Chicago, and we were presented by the couple in the middle there. They're business people from uh, Minnesota, and they purchased a 300-year-old scroll of the first five books of the Old Testament, and they presented it to us, and they did the same for several other schools. They've done it for 40-some schools. They bought this scroll. This scroll that you can see uh, Clinton Branscombe holding there it's uh, 300 years old. It comes from a synagogue in Babylon, uh, ba um, Iraq, I should say, where the Jews went. And, you know, things haven't gone well for Jews and Christians in Iraq. And so Jews are leaving there, and they're going to Israel. And they took this scroll with them. It's, it's a retired scroll. It's not a scroll that can be used in synagogue reading anymore. It's retired. So it's no longer what they call kosher. There's a long reason for that, but it has to do with the condition of the scroll, and it has to do with the corrections that have been made on the scroll. But, but we're allowed to have it and use it, and Jew, Jewish people shouldn't get offended by us having it and using it. I'll go on to the next slide. So this is, this is parchment, animal skin. And it's stitched together. Each of these sh sheets is stitched together. I'm not sure if you can see it from where you're sitting. If you'd love to see it, come visit me in, at Kingswood. I'll show it to you. But you see the lines there? Those are made with a score mark. <clears throat> and then the letters hang off the line. So this is the first part of the Bible. Bereshit. Bereshit bara Elohim. In the beginning, he created, and then the subject, God created. You notice that none of those letters touch each other? If they touched each other, that would be a mistake. They'd have to make that correction. So they, they're exacting in the way they copied these manuscripts. Let's go on to the next slide, if you would. Here's another manuscript. This is from Latin. Sometimes the, 
scribes actually drew things in the margins. The little hand there. Go on to the next slide. This is what's known as the Masoretic Text. Now notice the date there. This was for centuries the oldest Hebrew manuscript we had for the Old Testament. You notice the date there? 1,000 years A.D. Okay. So when was the first book of the Old Testament written? Around 1500 B.C. So 2,500 years. This is the oldest one we had. None of the originals survive. We have no originals from any of the biblical books. They're just copies and copies of copies of copies. So this is the oldest Hebrew manuscript we had up until the mid part of the 1900s. And then go on to the next slide. Anybody heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Yeah. They were discovered in these caves and other caves in this area. If you can picture the Dead Sea, this, this community of Jewish monks, basically what they were, sits up on the uh, northwest shore of the Dead Sea. And they copied these scrolls and they placed them in these caves in, in clay jars. Now, we don't know why they did that. It's possible that, like the scroll that we have at Kingswood, after it's so old, it ends up having to be retired. But you wouldn't throw it out. Like, what do you do with an old Bible that's fallen apart, right? You don't throw it out. What do you do with it? I don't know. I just keep them. But what they did is they actually stored them in something called a Geniza. Think of it as a, a rest home for retired scrolls. <laughs> so you stick them in there. Anyway, some people think that these caves were part of the Geniza of the Qumran community. Other people uh, speculate that the Romans are invading this area. And the Jewish monks that are a part of this community want to protect their scrolls, and so they hide them, assuming that once the Romans leave, they can go back and retrieve them, and they never did. Anyway, in the mid-1900s, a little shepherd boy was playing in this area with his flock, and he's throwing stones. You know, boys do that. Throwing stones up into these caves, and he hears them, the stone, hit these clay pots. And the long story made short, they, come, they go into these scrolls, and they, these caves, and they see them just filled with jars brimming with these scrolls. These are the Dead Sea Scrolls. And they pull these things out and they translate these things. Now, what was the date for the Masoretic text that I showed you up there, the oldest manuscript of the Old Testament? Okay. You just, with, the, with a little clink of the stone on the clay pot, you jump back over a thousand years earlier. So these scrolls were stored... Well, they, they weren't perfect, but they were, yes, and the, some of them, like there's one that is the entire book of Isaiah, all 66 chapters, and then there's others that are just much smaller portions, just like we saw with the other. So every book of the Old Testament is among these Dead Sea Scrolls, with the, with the exception of the book of Esther, and whether that was just accidental that it wasn't included, or you remember Esther was the woman who married the Persian king, and it's possible that the Jewish scribes didn't like that idea and just didn't bother <laughs> copying that book. We don't know why. But anyway, we've got all the other 38 books of the Old Testament. And what this shows us is two things. One, the Masoretic text, the 1000 AD, had been copied with a high degree of accuracy. So remember I was saying before, they, they took this very seriously and made corrections wherever they saw mistakes. But also, it showed us that where the Masoretic text did make a mistake, we now have the Dead Sea Scrolls to compare it to and to ensure that we're getting it right. Let me show you the next slide. That's a picture from uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, a page from the Psalms. Go on to the next slide. This guy was hunting for ancient manuscripts in Egypt, and he ended up on, uh, at the foot of Mount Sinai. There's an old Orthodox monastery there, 
goes way back to the fourth century. It's actually a door to the church that dates back to the fourth century AD. That's an old door. Anyway, he discovered a codex. A codex is a book. So instead of scrolls, the early Christians were known for being so eager to study the scriptures that they actually had to invent a different way of doing scrolls. Because scrolls are kind of cumbersome, right? You've got to unroll and roll. But a book form like this is a lot easier to use for study. And so the book was actually invented for Christians to study their Bibles. And the most famous manuscript that Tischendorf discovered at Mount, uh, foot of Mount Sinai, next slide please, This is the uh, monastery. I've been there. Is this one. This is a manuscript, Greek manuscript and Hebrew manuscript that dates back to, uh, I'm sorry, it's Greek manuscript that dates back to the fourth century AD. So this is another way that we have of checking the accuracy of our Bible. Let's go on to the next slide. This process of checking our manuscripts and the, the diligence with which these scribes worked leads us to this conclusion. The Christian can take the whole Bible in his hand and say without fear or hesitation that he holds in it the true word of God handed down without essential loss from generation to generation throughout the centuries. So a very interesting process by which we get our Bibles, but one where God preserves the truth uh, for us. Not just because we hope it's true, but because... But isn't it interesting that he used human beings to accomplish that? You know, he could have done it in any number of ways. What do the Mormons believe about their Book of Mormon? That God actually put his word on, on golden plates that you could just load onto a printing press and print them. See, no possibility of error. And, and what do the, the Muslims believe about the Quran? That God gave the word to Muhammad in Arabic you're not even allowed to translate the Bible, the Quran rather, out of Arabic into a modern language. You're supposed to read it in Arabic or don't read it at all. And I find what God does in this case so fascinating because he allows humans to be involved in the process and yet he superintends the process so by the time we get to it, we have absolute confidence that we've got the word of God just as God intended for us to have it. But that's not in English yet, and I've got about five minutes, so let me land this plane by just talking about how we get it into English. For most of the history of Christianity, the Bible was in first Greek, then first Hebrew rather, then Greek, and then Latin. And it was in Latin really up until the time of the Protestant Reformation in, in the 1500s, that starts. And with the Protestant Reformation, there is this impulse of getting the Bible into the hands of the people. This was very important to people like Martin Luther and others, that the Bible would go out of the hands of the priest into the hands of the people in the vernacular, the language that people spoke. And so you start to find the Bible translated into German and into English with people like Coverdale and Wycliffe and, uh, and Tyndale. Well, there is this sense that uh, people should have the Bible in their own language it picks up steam, and in the last 100, 150 years, there have been an abundant production of translations into modern languages, and the work of Wycliffe goes on to translate the Bible into all the languages of the world. So lots of translations being made in the last 100 years, I would say in the last 50 years, continued translations being made. The idea here being that, that language changes. So my grandmother, who's dead now, she was born in the 1890s. She died at 101. Now, in the span of grandma's life, language changed. And so my grandmother was born in what's known as the gay 90s, 
1890s. They're called the gay 90s. So my cousin comes out wearing a kind of nice, loud shirt, and my grandmother says to her nephew, oh, Joel, what a gay shirt. But the term gay had changed from the gay 90s to my, the way my cousin heard that word. Think of the word bad. Does that mean bad or does that mean good? I'm not sure anymore. I've seen a change go back and forth. That's the way language works. And you have to keep pace with the language. You have to. As a Christian, you have to keep pace with the language. Now you say, that's a strong statement, Steve. Shouldn't we get a translation like the King James or the New International Version and just stick with it? And if somebody wants to understand the Bible, they need to learn how to read my language? No, absolutely not. You can do that, but to the extent that you do that and insist that other people learn your language before they can learn the Bible, you are out of step with God. I know that's a strong statement, but what else can we do? This is a God who cared so much. You can shut the PowerPoint off. I'm not going to cover all that. Who, who cared so much about being known by people that he actually showed up among them. And how did he show up? Did he show up as he actually is? If he had, we'd all be dead. He showed up as a little baby. Listen to me. He translated himself into a little baby that people could know and understand. Now, not everybody did. Some people misunderstood him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But look at the initiative he took to make himself known. Now, if God is willing to take that kind of initiative to translate himself into the language of the people, how can we say to the people that God cares that much about, no, you've got to figure out how to learn our language as Christians, and then you can meet him. You see what I mean? It just doesn't fit. So I am all for making translations. Now, they have to be good translations. They have to be translations that go back to the original, make sure we're getting it right. But they've got to be in the language that people can understand. There's a variety of ways of doing this. There are a lot of good translations. If you're not sure you have a good translation, ask me. I'll tell you what I think. But the thing I want to leave you with is, is that if we are really committed to being followers of God, then we have to have the same passion to translate his word into the language of the people and to support those efforts that he demonstrated in sending Christ to us. I don't know if I've completely alienated you. If you don't agree with me, we can talk about it afterwards, but I'm convinced I'm right on this point. And so I'm convinced that what, whatever translations people are producing, as long as they're based on the best manuscript and done with a heart that's, that has that same translation passion from God, welcome them. Welcome them. Yes, sir. I would, hope, I would hope we are. Yeah, I would hope we are. And I would hope we're doing it consciously. I have a feeling this church is. From everything I've heard about you, it's the sense I get that you're really trying to be understandable. You're trying to put the gospel in the ways that people can understand. I commend you for that. But there is a certain sense of resistance, not that I pick up here necessarily, but that I picked up elsewhere. There are some people who say, and I'm really going to make enemies now, but there are some people who say, hey, the King James Version, if it was good enough for the Apostle Paul, it's good enough for me. And I'm saying, okay, for people today on the island who speak Elizabethan English, that's great. But I'm, I'm thinking that's a pretty small crowd. And so there better be a translation they can understand, and we need to take the initiative to get it to them. And it isn't just the King James. They wanted to translate the NIV. That's what I use. They wanted to translate the NIV into an updated version. And there was such a, a hue and cry that went up of people who felt toward the NIV the way other people feel toward the King James. They said, oh, you can't do that. So it isn't a particular translation. It's the mindset 
that the way I understand the Bible is the way everybody should understand the Bible. That's the mindset you got a problem with. So if that's your mindset, get rid of it. Get God's mindset, which is, hey, whatever I got to do to accurately represent the truth of this word and get into the people and in my life, that's what we're all about. All right, well, let's let that be the last word. Can I pray for you? Father, thank you for this time together and for your word. We are grateful that whatever process you use to bring it to us, we are confident that we have the truth that you have for us. We know it not just because through the process you've used men and women with keen insight and a heart for you, but also when we pick up that book and we read it, as our brother has reminded us, we know that we are handling the truth. And the combination of the accuracy, the scientific accuracy of textual criticism, along with the affirmation of the power of your word at work, confirms that we know we have your word. But Lord, it's not enough to have your word. We want other people to have your word too. And so I pray that you'll fill our hearts with a passion to communicate your word in a way that, that can have maximum impact in the hands of your Holy Spirit. And I pray that for this church that it would be known as a church that preaches and teaches the living word of God. In Jesus' name, amen.